Welkom bij Voor de Ommekeer, gesprekken over een wereld in verandering vanuit het Freedom Lab achter mij in Amsterdam. Mijn naam is David van Overbeek en vandaag heb ik de gast Nolan Geurts. Hij is assistant professor aan de Universiteit van Twente en we gaan het hebben over zijn boek Nihilisme en Technologie. Mr. Gertz, welcome. You recently you wrote a book uh, called Nihilism and Technology. Uh, what is nihilism and what does it have to do with technology? Right. Well, thank you for having me. And that's a, a good question. Uh, nihilism is certainly a word uh, that you see uh, frequently uh, in uh, newspaper op-eds, magazines. Um, but I find um, it's important to sort of separate um, the everyday understanding where it's sort of treated as a, a mentality of who cares, uh, I don't believe in anything, I don't care about anything, mm -hmm. um, and how it's been explored uh, philosophically. So my book uh, is, a, is a work of philosophy, uh, trying to explore uh, the history um, and the conceptual dynamics. So basically, uh, it comes out of uh, the philosopher uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, mm -hmm. a German philosopher, uh, who explored nihilism as basically um, a reaction uh, to, to life in uh, Judeo-Christian society. So nihilism is essentially um, how we uh, get through the day. That would be one way of putting it. Um, how you adapt to life uh, in a society uh, that due to uh, its moral values, its political ideals, it causes you suffering. Yeah. Um, so Nietzsche focuses specifically on, and because he was working in the 19th century, um, sort of 19th century habits, um, and I wanted to bring it into the 21st century, and that's where technology comes in. So how to understand the ways in which technology helps us to get through the day, and specifically what's at issue is that um, getting through the day can actually be self-destructive. So it's not just about relaxation, it's also about what it does to us uh, to to zone out, to relax, mm -hmm. to Netflix and chill. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that this is um, this is something that sh we should talk about right now? Because I, when I read your book, I kind of got um, an, um, an impression of urgency. Right. Like this is something that we need to address now, perhaps before it's too late. Or right. So at a time when um, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon uh, seem to be um, more important than perhaps uh, governments, religions. Um, and we really have to take seriously this idea that we are increasingly um, getting used to, uh, that we live in a what's called a technological world, mm. uh, that we are technological beings and technological cultures. Um, and really trying to take seriously if that's, uh, on the one hand, if it's good uh, or bad, uh, if it's uh, progress, um, but more importantly for me is not to get into these sorts of standard debates about good, bad, progress, regress, uh, but looking at what we actually think good, bad, progress, regress mean, and most specifically, and this is where the philosophy comes in, uh, how technology itself shapes what we think good and bad, progress and regress are. Okay, well, s some people would say, well, technology is something which is neutral, right? Which um, perhaps they would say something like, guns don't kill people, but people with guns kill people. Right meaning that technologies themselves are neutral, it's just about how we use them or how we choose to apply them in our societies. But you, you disagree with that view. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, this is the kind of view that you saw um, if you watched uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg's congressional testimony. Recently with the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Right. All right. Um, I think this was just a couple months ago um, and basically kept saying, you know, we build tools, Facebook uh, is a tool, Cambridge Analytica was a bad actor. Um, so obviously we need to find uh, new tools to combat these bad uses of our currently existing tools. Uh, algorithmic, uh, algorithms would be sort of the, the prime uh, example that he gives. Mm -hmm. um, and it very much mirrors what you suggested with this sort of gun debate mentality. Um, so it's not about uh, what Facebook is doing to privacy. It's about what Cambridge Analytica does with Facebook to privacy. Yeah. Um, but what's important to realize is that what technologies do, whether it's a gun or Facebook, um, is that it, it reshapes, it uh, mediates our relationship to the world. Um, so the most obvious example would be I'm, I'm wearing glasses right now. 
um, and I say, I see you, but in reality, I see the glasses seeing you. And what's important uh, from the perspective of philosophy of technology is the idea that um, it's the, f the forgetfulness of the glasses um, isn't just an accident. It's actually essential to how the glasses work. Yeah. So when I'm aware of the glasses, I'm not looking at you. When I'm looking at you, I'm not aware of the glasses. So there's an uh, important dynamic of revealing and concealing fascination and forgetfulness mm -hmm. uh, at work in human technology relations. And how does that work with technology precisely? Right. So uh, different technologies have different relations. Uh, this is why it's not neutral. It's, it's uh, actively influencing us. This doesn't mean that technologies are alive. Mm. Uh, it just means that, that that's the nature of what it means to be human. Uh, that basically our relationship to the world has always been mediated. Um, for Marx, it's money. For Freud, it's sex. Uh, for the University of Twente, it's technology. Uh, and actually, if you think about it, money and sex, that's also technological. Mm. So it's, it's all connected. Um, and it's important to think about this idea that um, different technologies provide different relations. So again, the glasses, this is what's uh, thought of as an embodiment relation. It's an enhancement technology and improves my eyesight. Uh, but there are also, uh, like my smartphone, uh, that's what's called a hermeneutic relation. It's uh, what gives me access to the world uh, interpretively. So there you get, for example, the current uh, dilemma about uh, fake news, post-truth. Um, and again, it's about the idea that if my only access to the world is through Google, through Wikipedia, through CNN.com, then I have to trust, uh, on the one hand, web providers. On the other hand, I have to trust the phone itself. And this introduces uh, a relationship that we hadn't really thought about before because we just take for granted that our access to the information is unmediated. Yeah, we just take for granted that Google is there and that we can always use our smartphone. And so what you're saying is that through this mediation, we become unaware perhaps of the ways in which we are mediated by these instruments that we use right. in the same sense that we don't notice the glasses once we put right. them on. Right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And so how would that, how would that work with Google or, tech, or Facebook, for example? Right, so for example, uh, to get here, um, I was using my phone uh, Google Maps application uh, to find my way from the train station to this building. Mm -hmm. um, Google told me uh, initially with the, with the blue dot arrow uh, to go one direction and I trusted it. Uh, but I had no way of independently confirming this. I'm just trusting Google. And then suddenly the dot moves and it tells me actually I've been going the wrong direction. So I have to turn around and go the other way. Yeah. Um, now as I'm walking here, I see, because uh, it's Amsterdam, uh, beautiful canals, beautiful buildings. Um, I'm, of course, uh, suddenly feeling the urge uh, to take photos. And thankfully, uh, of course, my phone just happens to also have a camera built into it. Um, and then, of course, there's also social media apps. So then, of course, I'm inspired uh, to post uh, photos on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And at some point, you start to wonder, um, do I think... Uh, Amsterdam is beautiful because that's me, or is it because that's what Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram need because they need my content to exist? So, but this kind, this kind of sounds a bit innocent, especially when you use the word nihil nihilism, right? Nihilism sounds really big, really heavy, like there's something that these technologies do to us that has something to do with the fundamental nature of human beings, perhaps. Right. So how, what would an example of technologies in a more or less innocent way look like? Right. Well, this is, uh, for example, what uh, the philosopher Shannon Valor talks about uh, with this idea of upskilling and de-skilling. Um, so as I said just a minute ago, uh, Google Maps is telling me where to go. Yeah. Um, this increases my navigational abilities. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I take for granted that I need the map, I need the phone, because uh, I have no idea where to go. And if uh, when I used to drive, when I used to walk, um, I would take a fold-out map, and I would know how to read the map. But now Google reads the map for me. Yeah. Um, I can even have a voice that tells me. Um, now, what I find specifically dangerous about this um, isn't just about this sort of upskilling, de-skilling, um, but also this notion that whereas I might have uh, asked someone for directions yeah. and had human interaction, I have a phone interaction, I have a Google interaction. Um, 
and it replaces again the voice of a, of a, a human contact with this um, bodiless voice. So it's um, sort of filling this void, but it's also the void that it's creating. So it's important uh, for my way of thinking um, that when we get on a bus and you put the bag down next to you and you uh, put on the sunglasses and you put in the earbuds and you take out the phone, um, that you're basically cocooning yourself off from the world. Yeah. And that technology really helps us uh, to, again, not only solve problems, uh, but to see so much of our everyday lives as problems in the first place. So these technologies themselves, they kind of speak, they kind of need the our view that there are problems in society that we can resolve through the usage of these technologies. Right. For example, even human interaction, basic human inter interaction. That's correct, right? Right. So uh, I recently saw, and perhaps you saw it as well, the, the Google presentation about the voice assistant mm -hmm. and about how your voice assistant in the future will be able to make calls with your right. barber and automatically you right. know, talk to each other and there will be no, even no need for humans to call each other. And um, I was very interested about why people were so excited about this. What is so exciting about having technology that can uh, dial your barber automatically while you could do it your own, or perhaps you could do it, you know, you could call them yourselves. Why, why, do, we, why do we receive these technologies with such enthusiasm? Right. Why is that the case? Well, this is what I find fascinating, because um, when people point out, um, you know, isn't this dystopia um, that we are becoming uh, more and more uh, separated off from other people, um, you have this sort of counter argument where people push back and say, okay, but I mean, People said the same thing when we started writing. People said the same thing when we had telephones. People had the same thing when we had the telegraph. Yeah. Um, so this isn't anything new. Um, and I think what's, what's helpful from the perspective of philosophy and a philosopher like Nietzsche is that, that that's not a good counterargument. That we have always been working in this direction to distance us from others. Um, yes, it, it means that new technologies are not to blame. It means that we are to blame. Mm -hmm. And that helps us to understand why we develop these technologies in the first place. So there's something perhaps in us that want that would want these kind of technologies themselves to exist. Right. right. It's more than just technologies that we create and that spin out of control, but we want them to be like this this way. Right. And this is why I say in the book, I'm I'm not talking about what technologies are doing to us, uh, as much as what we are doing to ourselves through technologies. Okay. Yeah. And so there are a couple of relationships that you mention in your book. Uh, five of them specifically you you um, you you go through and one of them perhaps it's good to just you know go mm -hmm. through them a little bit is the one which you call uh, techno hypnosis which which is the first human nihilism relationship which we have through technology what is uh, techno -hyp hypnosis right so uh, Nietzsche uh, discusses this idea um, and and I think this is uh, for him an analysis of German culture because um, he talks a lot about uh, German beer drinking uh, as sort of an example of what he calls self-hypnosis. All right. Yeah. Um, so drinking yourself into a stupor as a way to to get through the day. Yeah. Um, he also talks about uh, meditating, and what he classifies this as is sort of this this human um, urge to hibernate, um, and that we you know see bears hibernating in the winter, and we're jealous. Uh, you see your dog sleeping all day and you're jealous. Uh, so techno-hypnosis is sort of the, again, the 21st century version of this. Um, so I explore, for example, Netflix and Chill as an example, uh, binge watching generally. Yeah. Um, and this idea that you have um, hours and hours of time spent staring at a screen. And it's uh, not an accident that we've called it an idiot box, a boob tube, couch potato. Um, and you get recurringly um, on social media sort of these, these defensive uh, reactions. Um, you know, it's 2018, look who's in the White House. Of course, I need time. I need to relax. Mm. Don't judge me. All right. Um, so it's, again, interesting on the one hand that we develop technologies to allow us to relax. But yeah. on the other hand, we have this sort of defensive posture um, sort of indicating that we do have a sense um, that we are putting ourselves to sleep and we're trying to do it as much as possible for as long as possible. Yeah. So you have this, this movement of, uh, if, I, if I understand you correctly, it's, it's not just about 
trying to obtain a moral high ground by saying that, well, you know, binge watching or techno hypnosis, that's bad, but there's something in us, perhaps, in human nature that also has a longing for these kinds of things, and we might not um, like admitting that, that is the case, but we do struggle with it, because as you say yourself, we both binge watch a lot, but at the same time, we feel that this is something that we might not, that we're not very happy with. Right. So it's kind of a, uh, but we're not able to move beyond that, um, beyond that problem. Right. So it's a problem for us. And so is that is that true? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think it's it's again this idea. Um, going back to this idea of nihilism as as how you how you survive, um, and the key idea is that um, the more that life. Uh, feels like pain, like suffering, um, and we want, uh, we have this urge to avoid life. And so for Nietzsche, this was something that we did religiously, that we suddenly invent this idea of heaven and the afterlife and this longing uh, to, just, to just have life be over. So we are essentially the living dead, and this is why movies about zombies are very political. Um, <laughs> But also you have this idea that um, technologies are not the enemy of religion, they're the newest religion. And they again offer, I mean, we call it cloud-based computing. It's not an accident that we're evoking this sort of heavenly concept of, you know, it's all up there. Yeah. Um, and it's again this idea of, of um, you know, virtual reality, of augmented reality, of, of I'm, I'm unhappy and dissatisfied with the world. I need a new world. I need a better world. So our dissatisfaction is basically the, 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 the basis for the need for techno-hypnosis, that we feel the urge that this world in which we live is imperfect or I uh, feel dissatisfied with the world or with my life, and then I can avoid um, that pain or the suffering which I uh, engage with through this, uh, right. this world um, by engaging in techno-hypnosis, binge-watching right. and other kinds of stuff. So, and, and then you say at, in your book, techno-hypnotic hypnotic technologies can reduce our awareness of the, rule, of the role they play in shaping our ideas. Right. That would m seem to me that you're t taking it even further. You're saying, well, there's also a danger in techno-hypnosis. It's right. not just a phenomenon that is out there, but there's a danger in it as well. Right. Is that true? Yeah. So it's, again, um, the most contemporary example of this would be YouTube, because um, there's more and more awareness um, that YouTube isn't just um, this website that millions and millions of people go to to be able to watch whatever they want. Um, but YouTube is also um, algorithmically curating what people watch. Mm -hmm. And it's directing us to watch certain things. Um, so on the one hand, um, it's not just lulling us uh, into this comfort zone of, of being able to just watch whatever I want whenever I want. Yeah. Um, but it's also actively working to keep us watching. Um, so again, it's this idea of, of uh, using algorithms to learn about us and then to give us um, more and more and more um, so that we spend now uh, more time watching YouTube than we do watching television. So television was already um, an example that philosophers uh, in the 1950s started to take very seriously. Yeah. Um, as, as not just um, popular, but, but dangerous. Uh, the television shows actually shape how we see the world. Mm -hmm. And importantly, this idea of pop culture uh, creating what in the 50s was called the, the conformist mass society. Um, so we, we don't just like rom-coms, we don't just like uh, office sitcoms, but we start to see the world that way. And importantly for uh, critical theorists like Theodore Adorno, mm -hmm. There was this idea that um, they created a specific um, habitual understanding of how life should work, and that um, there's an eruption of uh, you know something doesn't work, uh, something bad happens in the office, something happens in your relationship. Um, you learn uh, that this is a dramatic element in your life, and you need to have the coworker that you laugh with, the coworker that's your enemy, your boss who's annoying, uh, and in 20 minutes it'll all get wrapped up. And it's importantly this idea uh, that you find in the sitcom of, of always returning back to zero. Yeah. And this idea that um, it puts in you a, a sense of complacency, that everything will work out in the end. 
And this return to the status quo, this formulaic nature of television, then in induces in the watcher a formulaic way of thinking about everyday life. Yeah. So through these um, through these technologies and through techno hypnosis, through the, um, the but also through the television criticism of the 1950s and the 60s, um, our ideas get shaped in a way that requires further investigation. You would say, and your book is kind of a call to action, if I might call it, call it that way, to further investigate how our how we as consumers, especially. Um, how we are influenced by these technologies and how our ideas are shaped by them, even though we might not notice it that way. Right. Okay, so there's another relationship that I want to um, discuss with you, which is the second relationship which you, which you mentioned, and that, that is the data-driven activity, which is kind of that we, the idea that we put more trust in algorithms and that we let them decide what we should do with our lives, uh, what we should do, where we should go to eat, where we uh, should hang out, stuff like that. Um, that would seem quite convenient mm -hmm. to me, right? And I guess most people would agree. But what 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 would be the danger when when we when these tech, when these algorithms take over more of our decision making processes? Right. So each of these relations um, is again a different a different way of avoiding some aspect of life. So techno hypnosis um, is about basically avoiding um, consciousness, about okay. avoiding feeling, because uh, feeling means pain, consciousness means pain. Uh, so sleep means pleasure. Uh, Data-driven activity, uh, it's much more about avoiding decision-making and the pain of having to uh, choose. So what data-driven activity is all about, uh, for example, with uh, the Fitbit, um, it just tells me to move, and I do it because it tells me to. Uh, and you get sort of these, these curated recommendations through algorithms um, and this sort of constant... Um, notifications of, you know, like when I'm walking around Amsterdam, um, you know, there's this cafe nearby, um, how about this place, you know, someone you know is in the area, why don't you give them a call? Uh, Google will even start asking, uh, you know, do you know about this place? Yeah. Can you answer questions about this place? Yeah. Um, and it's this idea that you're, uh, you're finding out about things uh, that you might not have found out about otherwise. So it's, it's giving you what you want. That's the theory. Um, but again, there, there were other ways for me to find out about these things, like, again, talking to people. Yeah. Um, or just the pleasure um, that you used to have in, in sort of this, this French culture of uh, just wandering around the city. Um, and it's becoming increasingly difficult with a smartphone to, to ever feel like you're just wandering. Yeah, because you're constantly receiving notifications about what you could do and right, what right. would be something that might interest you or stuff like that. Right. But there seems to be, uh, just discussing these two relationships, there seems to be, it seems to be the case that you're talking about information asymmetry, which is um, between the end consumer, if we might, might call them that way, that uses these products or these technologies and the way they are designed right. in the sense that we do not ourselves understand the decision-making process that these algorithms um, go through. Right. And perhaps it's even the case that this is just a black box, that even the, the ones, the, the engineers who designed them, right. that they don't even know what's going on in a black box, and that that is worrying in some sense. Right. That should worry us. Right. So again, there's, there's a dangerous element here. Um, on the one hand, the algorithm, in every human technology relation, there's, there's a giving and a taking away. Um, so it, it gives me uh, convenience, but it takes away the ability to uh, find out these things on my own. But there's this more dangerous element, uh, as you suggested, that um, algorithms are, are fundamentally opaque. And that even to the engineers who, who uh, create them, even to the people who code them, um, they don't really know why, for example, uh, when you put, um, uh, what was it, Deep Blue on Jeopardy, uh, and there's a math question and it says Toronto, well, what happened there? Yeah. Um, they don't really know because it, it, it's sort of this imagination and this is sort of the danger even of a metaphor of a black box that you could actually open it up and see the code and see Toronto pop up. Um, like if you remember the movie The Matrix, it says code, but they see things. Um, but that's not really how the code of an algorithm works. You mm -hmm. can't just see Toronto suddenly appear on your screen. No. Um, and so we, it's, it's dangerous... Um, again, because when we want to then put algorithms into uh, medicine, for example, 
Um, so it's increasingly being used uh, for diagnosis. Um, well, your cancer treatment could be a Toronto, and you have no idea. Our uh, algorithms are being used in loan decisions. And there's, uh, loan decisions are uh, regulated in a complicated fashion to avoid uh, bias about uh, religion, race, sex. And then you just tell the algorithm, please don't be biased. Yeah. And again, we don't know. Well, this, this was also because you, you just spoke about the Cambridge Analytica scandal and about Mark Zuckerberg in his, uh, his testimonial at the Congress. Um, what also struck me there, which I have to think about, I think about that right now, is, is that there's a, uh, a very large, seems to be a lacuna between what uh, the, the government understands about these technologies, or at least uh, Congress or in, in the European Union, uh, the, and and what these insiders like the Silicon Valley um, um, elites, what they know about what's going on, there seems to be a huge gap between that in that the government seems to struggle even to comprehend or understand what these technologies are and how they are shaping the world. So when in your book you're kind of giving this call to action to, 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 th to think that through, and when we see in real life that even governments, highly paid officials, whether they have... The, the largest amount of trouble to uh, to to uh, to think about what the impact actually is. How would you think? How would you say that we should go about doing that? Right. Well, this is um, the concern again, going back to the 1950s, um, that philosophers like Hannah Arendt, uh, Jacques Ellul uh, raised about. Uh, so for Arendt, it's about the rise of bureaucracy. Yeah. And this idea of society being run by experts, and experts are supposed to know how everything works and then we trust them. And this is the kind of thing that Kafka explored in his work, how this is actually a nightmare. Um, and then Jacques Ellul focuses much more on this idea of technocracy. But what's important for Ellul is this idea that societies are becoming more and more technological, but that actually doesn't mean um, that they are technocratic mm -hmm. in the sense that, and this is why uh, it's so important to realize uh, what's going on with Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, uh, they have increasingly uh, important roles in politics and society. Um, but Elul warns they have no interest in ruling. They have no interest in uh, policy. They have no interest in political ideals. Um, so they have more and more political power, but no political interest. So there's just this huge vacuum. Yeah. Um, and then because bureaucrats uh, are not technocrats, and uh, in the current <laughs> administration of the White House, there's actually even less expertise uh, than there was previously. Um, you, you really have to just bring these guys in the Congress and, and hope uh, that they answer your questions in a way you can trust. But you have no independent knowledge if what they're telling you is accurate. Yeah. Um, so again, they question Zuckerberg, and Zuckerberg says, please regulate us. Yeah. And of course, he knows that they have no idea what they're talking about, and they have no idea how to regulate them. Yeah. So unless you have uh, Mark Zuckerberg interrogating Mark Zuckerberg, um, then you can't have the technocrat, uh, tech expert, political decision-making that we actually need. Yeah. Um, so again, you just have this sort of, I hope it all works out, um, but we, we can't... Uh, and what's also important is this idea that if the algorithms themselves are increasingly opaque, even to Mark Zuckerberg, then even if Zuckerberg is interrogating Zuckerberg, you actually get the feeling that, no, 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 you need an algorithm interrogating an algorithm. Yeah, yeah. So then we're back at where you started. Like, um, there's, there's a, uh, when we encounter problems with technologies these days, kind of the standard reaction we have is, oh, we need more technology. So we need a Mark Zuckerberg or we need another Facebook uh, to kind of uh, reveal how Facebook works and how it shapes our ideas that we need more technological investments in that. Right. But um, this seems to be, because you, you just said that this, they, they're not particularly interested in, in politics, but this seems to me kind of a belief in the free market ideal, right? That there will be a competitor of Facebook um, eventually somewhere, or the, 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 uh, the idea of um, arranging your economical societies to the ideas of free market that will automatically spawn and sometimes uh, uh, another Facebook that will just take over and that will right. do better perhaps. Right. But isn't that more faith than uh, a good way to think about 
it's kind of a laissez-faire, right? I mean, it's just like we're just letting it happen and we're once again ducking responsibility to, right. to do something about that and just hoping that something will come along. Whilst at the same time, Facebook obviously has billions of dollars. They can buy out any competitor that right. they want. Right. They're just a monopoly. They won't go away. And it's very hard to, to, to take them away right. with 2 billion users. Right. Yeah, so again, it's, it's this sort of um, this feeling um, that we just sort of hope um, that our tech overlords are um, uh, nice people mm -hmm. and that they don't want to kill us all. Um, and so far, it feels like, uh, well, it's just free market enterprise and they don't want our blood, they just want our money. Um, yeah. And they're giving us products in exchange that make our lives more convenient, more pleasurable. Um, so right now, this arrangement seems okay with us. But if, as I, as I try to work out in the book, that it's, it's already uh, destructive, it's already dangerous. We don't need uh, robots rampaging in the streets because um, we're, we're perfectly capable of destroying ourselves without the robot. Um, we need to really think about not only um, how, to, how to combat uh, what's happening in technology, but if it's even possible because of how ubiquitous technologies have become, um, can we sort of step outside to even evaluate what's happening? It seems to be impossible. Right. So if technologies are shaping uh, how we see the world, how we think about the world, uh, how we act in the world, then is there any uh, position we can take on technology that's not already infused by technology? Yeah. Because if you want to answer to that, you just go to Google. Right. Which is once again, <laughs> like you know, right. yeah, that's kind of uh, that's kind of depressing. Right. Um, but so yeah, that's, that seems to be a large problem with that. But what also strikes me is that perhaps these technologies themselves, so they induce us in ducking our responsibility and um, through techno hypnosis and stuff like that. But perhaps we're also creating a world through them that we might not even want to create, but that we do out of convenience. And perhaps that is a political act. I was thinking about uh, the, what could be the, di what is the difference between voting for a political party that wishes to abolish worker rights or um, diminish the influence of unions and stuff like that, and you as a consumer using your Uber app to just take a cab ride and basically destroying the, the right. traditional cab industry or the cab driver's uh, market um, uh, through that. Um, right. It seems, seems to be more of a political act than we seem to understand. It seems to be less innocent to just use your Uber app because you're actually creating, politically creating the world in which uh, the traditional cab industry will just diminish because the drivers will go where the money is. Right. And um, so it seems like we're more... We also buy into the politics of these of these technologies, even right. though they might not be interested in that. What do you think right. about that? Yeah, I mean, this is the difference again between the the tech CEO and the technology itself. So the tech CEO might have no interest in actually invading your privacy uh, because the tech CEO might not really care about your privacy. Um, but what's important again is that the technology is is shaping what we think privacy means. Yeah. And so to get into the debate about whether Facebook violates or doesn't violate is to misunderstand the real danger of how much Facebook has already pushed our understanding of what it means to be private into a way that's way more open than we would have thought before Facebook. Yeah. So again, it's this idea of uh, the sort of reshaping aspect and how. Uh, how much of our everyday lives, our political decisions, um, are, are reshaped in such a way that, for example, as you were discussing, this idea that um, there's a complicitness. Um, so when Facebook uh, is accused of violating privacy, it's sort of implied, well, isn't that why you're on Facebook in the first place? That you want to invade the privacy of friends, family, mm -hmm. ex-girlfriends. Um, so you blame us for letting you do what you want. Um, and again, it's this idea that um, you know, anything that you're going to accuse us of is something that you're doing through us. You're in it yourself as well. Right. So yeah. if you blame Apple for having this Foxconn factory, but you're blaming me on your iPhone, then you're a hypocrite. So we're all hypocrites, we're right? Techno-hypocrites. Right. And this is where you get this sort of trolling culture of virtue signaling 
oh, you, you complained while you're doing it yourself. So really, you don't really care. And this is, again, where something like nihilism comes in. You can't obviously really care because you're part of the problem. Yeah. And so in your book, you're saying here, Nietzsche here can help us to understand one of the central paradox of social media, which is what you're discussing now, the paradox of knowing that social media opens up to becoming the victim of a shame campaign, mm -hmm. possibly ruining our lives, and yet we nevertheless continue to use social media. If our primary motivation for using social media is to be social, to communicate with others, to make friends with others, then it would seem that we would have long recognized the toxicity and explosiveness of social media and have sought safer means to achieving this end. That's kind of a vignette about how we think about social media. We call them social, right. that's kind of the marketing campaign and we use the word all the time, but right. as, as you expose in your book, or at least looking at it through the lens of Nietzsche, we are actually more cruel on social media than we are social in like a more positive right, way. Right. And so there's a, the hypocrisy seems to be, we're all in it, but we can't move beyond it. So how, how would we be able to move? Beyond? Is there a possibility to step out of it whilst right. we're inside this, this world, which is increasingly full of technology, it becomes more ubiquitous? Right. Is it possible to step out or to, to redefine what it means to be human in this technological world? Right. So, uh, for example, the, the philosopher Martin Heidegger, um, who's a... Um, a Nietzschean philosopher of technology in the 50s, um, says that the, the, the essence of technology um, is what it reveals about us. And so what's interesting to me is the, the way that social media um, doesn't necessarily make us cruel, because again, it's not this deterministic what it's doing to us, um, but what it reveals. Um, so Nietzsche, again, talks about this idea of um, these sort of medieval festivals of cruelty. Um, that these, these public shaming rituals have always been there and have always been very important. Um, and I discuss this idea that um, John Ronson finds in, in his book on shame campaigns, um, that this, this public shaming was put to an end not because it was uh, becoming less and less uh, useful, but actually because it was, it was too powerful. So again, it was this idea um, that we, we are given to uh, for various reasons, uh, public shaming rituals. And then you invent technologies that allow you to do this in ways we've never thought about before. Yeah. And then it reshapes what we think it means to be social. So it's not that social media is actually antisocial. It's that it's redefining and revealing at the same time what sociality means to us. And then why is Nietzsche, a 150-year-old philosopher, why is he such a good well, it sounds almost like a psychologist. Why is he such a good psychologist of society to, to reveal that? Right. Why so, did you choose to use him, or why should we use him? Right. Well, he does call himself um, a cultural physician, um, and he's inspired by uh, psychology, which at that point meant Dostoevsky, um, and he's the inspiration of Freud. Um, so you can, you can sort of see a straight line through Nietzsche. Um, but I do think it's important, going back to what I said earlier about you know, how, do you, how do you take this step back, uh, step outside? Uh, well, I think the, the key way to do that today is through philosophy. Um, philosophy allows you to not only explore uh, hypothetical worlds, but more, more importantly, um, it enables you to see that, again, as we were talking about earlier, the, the, these problems are not new, um, but they've been around for a while and they are involved uh, in the project of humanity. And that philosophy, uh, that, that's what philosophy is. Philosophy is about studying what it means to be human. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, philosophy is the way to go. <laughs> uh, and Nietzsche, uh, because he was so fascinated with uh, suffering, with society, with these dark elements in humanity, um, of how we destroy ourselves in our everyday lives, yeah. then, then I think he is sort of the best philosopher to guide us. Yeah. So I also get the idea that when I read your book, just by reading it and by going through these, uh, uh, the five relationships that you organize, that you um, uh, recall, or the nihilistic relationships that we have with technology, is that that gives you kind of a framework to go about and to think for yourself how these. Uh, technologies are influencing myself. Right. Um, but at the same time, it seems like this is uh, kind of a catch-21 where we're at the, 
the same time, it leaves it doesn't it leaves me very um, powerless to change my own situation, because of course there are some people who detox from digital detox who just you know they they go on vacation and leave their smartphone at home, um, but that doesn't seem to be solving the problem because every time we turn on the smartphone again, it induces in us or it evokes in us the same new cruel perhaps uh, uh, relationships that we have social right. relationships. So you know once again we install Tinder or uh, we we. We 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 uh, spy on other people through Facebook instead of just using it for friends. Right, right. So there seems there seems to be kind of it seems to be difficult to do something about that, and that that sort of fascinates me as well. Is that at the political level, which you would say that is kind of the decision making level at which these kinds of um, problems in society should be discussed and should be you know how, how should we do something about that. That at a political level, it seems to be impossible to to arrange something something of that. Right, and I think this is actually um, another key element: the danger of of techno culture that it it reinforces. Um, and this is what I'm what I've been working on most recently: um, the sort of individualistic mindset, yeah. such that I do have to uh, increasingly see these problems as as how can I do anything about this. Yeah, um, aren't I powerless? Um, but it's important that as soon as you think of this as um, individualistically, then you, you've already sort of given up. Uh, this is again the, sort of the work of Hannah Arendt. You, you've already sort of um, um, quit the political battlefield because you've, you've said, well, I'm powerless, so what can I do? Um, and this is how you get Donald Trump because, you know, what's one vote? Um, so it's it's important as as you were saying that it's it's really these are political issues. These are not personal issues. These are not even psychological issues. These these are political. Um, and this is why if we if we really want um, to address uh, techno culture, we have to very much like climate change, uh, see what technologies are doing as an environmental danger. Yeah. Yeah. And that environmental dangers have to be affected through political change, not personal. Yeah. Um, so it feels good to recycle, and you should, but you can't expect that uh, to save polar bears. No. That, that has to be done at a governmental level. Yeah. And if governments aren't doing it, then that's a call for revolution. Yeah. Which is why, again, you have this sort of technological, political interrelationship where it's not an accident that I see everything individualistically if that's going to make me more for the status quo and less for revolution, yeah. then that's a, an advantage both for the tech companies that are already powerful and for the politicians who are powerful. Is that what we need, a revolution? Well, we at least need to be open to it. I mean, for Hannah Arendt, the idea of, of a miracle uh, is just human action. And that we really have to take seriously that, um, that political change um, is always possible. Um, and as soon as you think it takes a religious miracle, um, then obviously you're in for a life of suffering. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because it seems to me that these we we te we tend to think that we're social through social media or through smartphones, or uh, that we can even organize protests online that will do something about you know that will influence the political decision making process. But at, immediately when we discuss these um, issues. Uh, online, it privatizes these relationships as well. I kind of become feel myself isolated and powerless uh, because what it might need is some traditional going on the streets or, uh, well, I wouldn't say uh, going on with uh, torches through the, through the city, but perhaps it needs some more traditional approaches like um, debates or entering, entering, entering into in debates with each other not online behind a fake persona, but you know, genuinely. But you also mentioned in the book that that is at the same time very hard because it's much more easier to do it online. Right? Right. It's much more easier to, uh, in the dating, uh, in, in, uh, when you're dating, to reject someone online on Tinder than do it in real life. But it's it, it's arguably also very much more harder to to engage in political discussion with someone in real life right. instead of online. Right. So while whilst what I'm worried about here as well, which struck me through your books, that whilst we're uploading all these kind of um, traditional ways in which we 
go about with each other, like with just conversation, political debates, dating, etc. We are forgetting that what we need for change is not this online social environment, but we actually need the more, well, traditional is not the right word, but it's kind of the word to just to point out to it. We need the more, uh, the more traditional ways to, to, to really um, make that change happen. Right. Right. So if we, if we, um, this is one of the counter arguments I typically get is that, well, are you just saying the technology is bad? Um, because look at uh, Tahrir Square, look at Occupy Wall Street, look at these, these political movements, uh, hashtag me too, look at um, the, the March for Women, the March for Science. These are, these are things organized through the internet. Yeah. Um, so clearly, uh, you know, isn't, isn't technology a force for good? And again, you get back into the argument we talked about in the very beginning, that it's just a tool. And it's about using it in good ways, not bad ways. Mm -hmm. So I see increasingly social media campaigns like hashtag drones for good. So again, it's not, it's not that drones are bad. It's yeah. just about who's using it. Yeah. Um, but this is what misses uh, the key aspect that I uh, talk about philosophically about how it actually shapes. It doesn't just enable, it shapes what we're doing and how we think about what's possible. Um, and this idea that um, you can organize online, that's great. Um, but it's also important to think about how it shapes what we think it means to organize and have political action. Um, and how it didn't get, and it's uh, from a big picture perspective, it allows you to protest. But if it's reinforcing the status quo at the same time, then what's the purpose of the protest? Yeah. Um, so it's again important to think about the sort of the big picture of uh, the techno culture that you're contributing to, even while protesting the techno culture, because you're doing it through the techno culture. Yeah. Um, and this is why, uh, sort of, you know, the brilliance of, um, on the one hand, uh, liberalism. Uh, you know, you you have free speech, so you can always complain, but the free speech is guaranteed by the government that you're complaining about. Yeah. Uh, you also have it in, in capitalism. Um, Capitalism can absorb everything. So I can go to any shop, uh, any, any giant capitalist uh, marketplace, and buy uh, Karl Marx, Che Guevara, Lenin, uh, because they're all just new brands. And you, you have your Marx brand. Um, so capitalism just absorbs everything. Yeah. Liberalism absorbed everything. So there's no, way, there's no way out, out of there and no way to think about that. Perhaps only through philosophy. Well, it builds, it builds into itself the ability to feel like you're protesting. And it's the experience why, of protesting. Right. Yeah. And it, it becomes like a, like a VR simulator. Yeah. Something we enjoy. Or, right. Yeah. So you need to take seriously the idea that there are more things possible than what you think is possible. I think that's a good way to end this conversation. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.